So I'd like to welcome Mike Apgar. Uh, Mike is a graduate of the ENA master's program. He has been working at Fishbeck for quite some time now. Yeah, about um, 25 years. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'm pleased and honored to have him uh, speak with us about vapor extraction. And I apologize for the delay, but we got Mike in, so that's good. So thank you all for being patient. And um, I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And I want that one. Continue and share. All right, I gotta drag this over here. Is that showing up for everybody? It looks good, Mike. Okay, I'm gonna switch my display sweating settings here. Okay, so um, this is a project that we did, well, quite a, quite a, quite a bit ago, it was 2018. Um, so we were uh, still kind of in the infancy of doing these, this work. But this particular project came up really quickly and had a short timeline, like every single project we've ever done has. Uh, but this was a, a, a sub-slab a depressurization system in a, a, a fruit processing facility up in Sparta, Michigan. Um, so we uh, we were doing a, gonna gonna do a phase two and oh please just if you have any questions about the the lingo or or any kind of uh, of letter that's here just just raise your hand or shout out or un unmute yourself and just ask. Um, so phase two project for a fruit juice processing plant um, they were doing a big property transfer, and when we did sub slab soil gas sampling we uh, got some stuff we didn't expect and uh, that just made the, the timeline that much faster and that much more more important. So here's where th the location is. This is, uh, if, for those of you who, who know anything about Western Michigan, this is, this is US 37 going north. This is Sparta. The, science, the, the site is right on, um, right on the, uh, that, that, that highway. Uh, it's a 140,000 square foot facility on a 12 acre parcel. It's constructed over, over you know, quite some time. Uh, there was a diesel tank that was removed. The, uh, um, basically the entire fill, and this is something that I've run into more often than I, than I care to explain, was foundry sand. I mean, downtown Grand Rapids is built all on foundry sand, and it's a, it's a problem. Um, so in the site's a facility, which means it's, it's, it's regulated by Part 201 uh, uh, Michigan Eagle uh, uh, rules for groundwater. Um, this is what the production area looks like. Uh, there's a, a lot of, um, uh, of moving machinery. This area down here is a conveyor. You can see some of the, uh, the juice bottles that are being, uh, being filled. Um, notice the floor, you can't see it here, but it, it's wet and that, uh, that, that is gonna be a problem. Um, sorry about the picture, but here's another one from the side showing the, the, uh, some bottles that have some juice in them. And this is the blending area. These are large tanks, uh, five to 750 gallons. Uh, and uh, um, this is where a lot of the, the, the ju juices are, are, are blended for production before they're bottled. Here's the floor. Notice how it's all wet. There's a big floor drain right here. And then here's, a, here's actually a construction crack or a construction seam right here. And that'll be a problem too. Um, so the um, buyer wanted to update the phase two. Uh, timing critical, um, and the buyer just wanted to basically get out of a get out of jail free card for anything that's found on the site, which is pretty standard. Um, six weeks is not standard. This uh, this usually is a like a, a three to six month process. Um, but the deliverables included an updated phase two remedial remedial system design and installation and a BEA do care plan. <laughs> do care plan. Um, so the phase two was going to require uh, groundwater and soil investigation. Uh, we used a geoprobe, which is a, a standalone unit that's a, that can uh, that can push sampling rods down, depending on the on the uh, um, depending on the formation, to sixty or seventy feet. Um, and we use these to collect soil, and then at the same time, if, as we get into groundwater, we can collect groundwater directly through the uh, the, the, the sampling rods. Um, this. Uh, more is just to show you what we had to cover and not so much what the results are, but the, uh, the yellow ones are soil, the, the blue ones are groundwater. So we, we took a, quite a bit in the way of uh, sample, samples and, and, and then had them analyzed. So we found some stuff, naphthalene and metals, which is probably part of the foundry sand piece, 1,4-dichlorobenzene, 1,2,4-trimethylbenzene, and some of the PNAs and the metals. 
Um, when the buyer saw this, the VOCs, the one one four dichlorobenzene and the one two four trimethylbenzene, they're like, okay, we got to do a, a, an ambient air monitoring event, and this consists of taking um, sample devices called SUMA canisters and placing them in various areas about the plant. And these uh, SUMA canisters have a one atmosphere vacuum on them and they have a device that controls how quickly air flows into them. Then they are sent off to the lab and the gas that's been uh, recovered is analyzed for various constituents. Uh, so for the sub slab, um, these things are called Cox Colvin vapor pins and they just we just push those in through the concrete floor and into the sub slab area. And then we're able to put measuring devices, collection devices on the vapor pins. We also use those uh, when we do a pilot test, which I'll talk about. And then we had seven eight hour air uh, ambient air samples. And these samples are just out there. We turn them on, we go away, we come back eight hours later, collect them and then send them off to the lab. So these are our soil vapor probe locations. Once again, you can see we covered the majority of this um, uh, of this air, of these uh, of the floor area of the factory, 140,000 square feet. Um, and when you're doing something like this, it's not like you can say, "Oh, I think it's here, but not here." You really have to cover the whole the whole floor plan, or you, you know, you're going to be insufficient. And then the regulating body is going to come back and say, "Well, you got to do more work." So this is actually set up by Eagle um, for uh, incidents of uh, of of, uh, of of our sample points based on the floor area of the factory. And then ambient air sampling locations are a little less stringent about this, but basically we cover uh, places where there's people working. So we found chloroform. Um, while it's not, a, it's not a recognized environmental concern, uh, it is a carcinogen and a hazardous air pollutant. Uh, and there are uh, recommended interim action screening levels, or risals, um, and uh, they exceeded those by quite a bit. And again, remember the client wanted all protections. So we got to do something about that. Here's, here's the numbers. The, um, the risals are, are uh, the, the recommended numbers from DEQ in August of 2017, no longer DEQ, now Eagle. And then um, you can see that our numbers for res non-residential were 87, which was considerably higher than what they were, than the, are recommended. So a couple of chloroform results here, you can see in the process area and then off here to the side of the process area where we got 4,500 micrograms per cubic meter. And then down here, we got 1,300 micrograms per cubic meter. And then the ambient air, which is actually a little bit more telling. This is actually what people are being exposed to. And these are just barely above the risals. You still have to do something about it though, because that's the data. Um, this, uh, it's a, this is kind of a confusing slide, but what's going on here is that the purple areas are the process and the pink areas are the blending rooms. And you can see the chloroform numbers are quite high in blending rooms and in some of the production rooms. And there's a reason for that. And it took us a little bit to figure it out. So ambient air again, blending room at three, production area at 3.2. And then the chloroform concentrations are high but where did it come from? You know, that's one of the things that we really don't know too much about. And it's a food processing facility. Uh, facility. It's gotta be clean. So they have, and we just saw this in, in totes, which are 260 to 300 gallon standalone containers uh, that in different parts of the area, but the 25% sodium hypochlorite stock solution in it. Um, floors were continuously mopped, spray bottles at the, the lines. You remember where we saw the conveyors and all that? Well, there's people spraying that down all the time. So there's lots and lots of sodium hypochlorite solution all over the place. Well, carbon plus acetone and, ethetone, and ethanol, um, as a, acetone and ethanol, sorry, uh, plus bleach equals chloroform. I mean, this is trihalomethanes. I'm sure you guys have probably run into this in some of your other your other um, engineering classes. But these are these are uninformed cons or, or sorry un undesired consequences of dis disinfection. And it happens a lot at, at water treatment plants. And again, this is a repeat. High numbers, at 3,100, 4,500, and then the ambient air three and 3.2, and then above the chloroform um, above risals in the sub slab is associated with the production uh, zone or production area. And it's also with blending. So we need to control the chloroform. 
and uh, that basically prompted um, a mechanical solution, an engineering solution, where we needed to install a sub-slab depressurization system. And you remember this is 140,000 square foot facility, so it's gotta be big and it's gotta be fast and it's gotta work the first time. And we gotta do a pilot test for that. And pilot testing, and this is just before I get into this, pilot testing is a big deal here. I mean, you can't do a design without a pilot test. You need to know, you know how big to make your system, you know how extensive to make your system. And what, so this is what pilot tests are designed to do. Um, this is a, just a graphic of what a pilot test uh, of apparatus would look like. Um, there is a vacuum blower, which is where, where your motive power is. Um, and then there's a, a extraction point that I'm just identified as PT1, as pilot test one. Um, there's a vacuum gauge at that point. And then there are various points where we put the sub slab uh, so, uh, pins in at five, 15, 25, and 35 feet from PT1. And then that's not necessary that they be at this, at this interval, but this is a starting place. So we turn on the blower, we set the vacuum at some, at some arbitrary uh, number, and then we measure what the uh, flow is using a differential pressure meter. Um, and we can control vacuum with the dilution valve. So this is, again, a pretty straightforward setup for a pilot test uh, apparatus. Um, now, when we did this pilot test in, um, in 2018, uh, we didn't know as much as we do now. So I'm going to just go over a pilot test for another project that we just completed about a year ago and show you the, the basics of how we arrive at the numbers we arrive at. So this particular number, this particular piece, let's see if I can pull it in. Um, so this is the raw data page. And what, we, what I have here is location. So PT1, pilot, point, pilot test point one, and then various locations where we measure vacuums. Mike? Oh, please, please interrupt. I, you know, I tend to get on a roll here and, uh, and uh, just, just keep going. So let me back up on that. So here's our locations. PT1 is the point where we're actually applying the vacuum. And then the PTs at different, at, at, with different um, uh, numbers after them are the points where we're measuring vacuum. And then we have times. And then these are the PT1. So this would be the, the um, vacuum at the point of extraction. And these are the vacuums that are measured at the uh, various uh, points out on the out in the floor. So at five feet away from our vacuum point, 10 feet, at 15, at 25. And with these, we can generate a profile of how air moves underneath the floor. And by doing this, it gives us the opportunity to, to be able to select um, a range of operations that we want our, our, our system to work at. So these graphs that are then generated based on the distance from the extraction well and then the, the vacuum at the various points, you can see here that um, this at PT1, at, at 10 inches of water vacuum, at 15 inches of water vacuum, at 20 inches of water vacuum and 25 inches of water vacuum, we get a little bit more depth of, of vacuum, but if you see where it intersects the zero point, they're all pretty much the same place. And PT1 actually didn't perform very well for us. We ended up with, with a, 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 a tight formation there. And what it did was it caused us to select a, a radius of influence, which is uh, an ROI, and that'd be the distance that we can design our extraction points for the entire system of about 25 feet. If you run a, a regression analysis through these, um, you can see that we have, by choosing uh, 0 0.02 inches of water vacuum, that we were about 30 feet, 30 feet, 30 feet, 32, 30 feet. So that this, with this particular extraction point, we said, all right, we got 25, uh, 25 foot ROI for the, a little bit of safety on it. When we did a second point, um, we got in quite a bit more uh, radius of influence. And this particular one, you, you notice how big that data set was for PT1. We were done with this one in about 40 minutes because it just, we just kept turning the vacuum up, turning it up, and it, it just never, never stopped. And then for this guy, we, we, um, we, we uh, calculated an ROI of 50 feet. Now, these ROI, what these ROI numbers tell you is how far apart in the, in the design to put your extraction points. And each extraction point is installed in the floor and it's hooked up to the blower. So if you have a 25 foot ROI, 
then you're probably going to be about 50 feet, uh, uh, about a 50 feet foot distance between uh, adjacent extraction points. If you've got a 50 foot ROI, you can push as 100. So you can see there's 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 a real advantage to in the design to determining what the ROI is because if you go to 100 feet for distances between your extraction points, well, you've halved your you, the effort you have to do. And remember that these points have to all come back to the blower itself. So there's a lot of piping that's involved and a lot of valves and a lot of measuring. So the better the ROI, the better everything is. All right, so if I, now I'm gonna go back to the, um, the presentation itself. So if I close that, are we back to the presentation now? So you'll need to unshare that and now go back to the presentation. All right. So you're back, you're back. Am I? Okay, good, good. Okay. I, have, I have three screens, so it's, it's a little you're confusing. <laughs> um, so for this particular pilot test, which I will go over, um, so we, uh, we used a, a, a half horsepower centrifugal blower um, and then uh, with a 45 inch vacuum and 50 SCFM flow. Um, we used a digital manometer to measure vacuum points. Uh, we measured at 15 and 20, and uh, 25 and 50 feet away from the vapor extraction points using the Cox Colvin pins. And again, arbitrarily, we select a negative 0 0.02 inches of water um, at, uh, at sufficient pressure to prove influence. So here's, we're back here at the, at the factory. You see, here's our extraction point and here's our pins. And, you know, again, think back that this was, we were really just getting started here. You know, had I been doing this now, I probably would have had six extraction points. I, you know, I just finished uh, one down at a, in, in Middleville at a large factory and we did six, um, much larger than this one. But yeah, it's, it's the more, the more, more points you can put out there, the more your assurance is that you've got a system that's gonna cover what you need. So here's our times, our system vacuums, which is we write at the vacuum point. And here's our IDs for SSVPs, and then the measured vacuums. And velocities, which we measured in this particular case using a hot wire anemometer, instead of using the differential pressure gauge, um, gave us the performance um, that we needed for this system. Now, one thing that's not demonstrated in this figure is that this entire area is completely, completely enclosed or completely covered with stacks of, of, uh, of, of juice pallets that are like 40 feet high. So you know, there's only certain places you can actually get in here and do this. And at the time that we did our pilot testing, we were severely limited to, for access. And it, there hasn't been a time when I haven't run into an issue with, with access, particularly with, a, with a, 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 um, a facility that's under operation. So um, we designed with 25 foot radius of influence. Uh, and now that production area, there are freezers and there's the, the, all of the, the equipment that's used to move, uh, move the product and the tanks. And so we kind of had to, had to pick and choose where we could put our points and still maintain that 25 foot ROI. So we went with 10, 10 manifold at extraction points. And in order to cover some of the other pieces, we had to put in three standalone blowers. And if any of you are familiar with radon type blowers, this is what we put in. And they, they work pretty well, but they have a pretty small ROI. So they're just for basically for point source. So this is what our um, our system look like. This is a manifolded system. You have, we have all of these points that we put in and these are hooked up and piped back to this part of the building where our blowers are located. We had standalones here, here, and here. And those were just, just basically pits that we put in with piping and then we put, the, put them through the floor, uh, through, through the wall and discharge them outside. Here, all this system discharges outside at this point. And when we were done, we had nearly an acre under vacuum. Um, and that was, that was pretty impressive. We, we were not ex expecting to get that good performance out of the system itself. Um, so we had two different, blow two independent, two independent blowers um, and you could cross over, which means if one goes down, you can still pull with, with one and, and hook it up. So that's pulling on all 10, uh, 10 points. So the 10 manifold extraction points and then three standalone axial blowers. Um, but this is, uh, the condensate is something that, that I've, I've kind of learned the hard way. Um, every time that you move air from underneath a building and you discharge it, you are gonna get condensate, particularly when the temperatures go down. 
and you have to control for condensate. If not, it's going to blow. It'll it'll plug up the blowers. It'll freeze. There's all kinds of problems with that. So the um, the design points for the blower itself um, were 80 inches of, of water, and we were sitting at about 35 to 40 inches on our pilot test. And I like to put a two two time safety factor on that so that the blower runs in the middle of its performance curve. Um, this would give us the 37,000 square feet under vacuum with approximately five pore volume exchanges per day, which means that every, every you know, uh, we get five times every day that entire soil volume uh, of the pore volume is moved out and replaced. And this is, um, so this is a, 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 a process, an instrumentation diagram or a pipe flow diagram that shows the layout of the equipment. Um, so here's our, these, these, these represent our 10 uh, extraction points. Uh, these are the vacuum blowers, and these are the controls for the vacuum blowers. The valves themselves can be adjusted so that we can balance flow and vacuum across the entire system. Um, these are simply knife gate valves, which means you, you can just pull them to open and push them to close. Uh, in this particular one, there are vacuum relief valves in case something gets plugged up. We don't want our blowers to, to, to over vacuum and, and damage themselves. There's also a pressure relief valve in, clay in case we get a plug on the discharge like condensate, condensate freezing. The fuse disconnects are, are, are very important. Um, these are what power the blowers, but there's also some information that's involved with those that's pretty necessary. You got to know if they're energized. So there's a red light even though nothing's running. You gotta know when they're running. So there's a green light when it's running. And then there's a couple of other pieces that can be applied to give you an indication if you've got a problem somewhere. This particular system did not have that. Um, it wasn't necessary since we have 24 hour a day occupancy of the, of the, the factory itself. Um, so we had uh, about 26 square feet to put the stuff in. Um, all the conveyance piping went on the walls and then I've got a few pictures for you. So here's those, those main disconnects as this talk talking about. I mean, they are energized at this point because that light is red. This is one of the blowers. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is called a centrifugal blower or a, a regenerative blower. Uh, this is the blower itself. This is, the in, this is uh, uh, the, uh, an air filter. This is the intake from the system. So this is where it's hooked up to all of the uh, extraction points. And then the discharge is on the other side, which goes up to uh, a piping on the wall and then eventually makes it to the outside of the building. Um, this is one of the standalone systems. You know, so what we have here is on the inside, uh, here's the, the, the actual suction pit. And then there's a manometer so we can visually see if we've got vacuum. And then uh, air direction and identification. Um, you know, if you just have a, a, a PVC pipe without any ID on it, someone at some point is going to wonder what that is. Outside, there's, um, this is the actual fan. So this takes the place of the vacuum blowers that we have on the uh, manifolded system. It's a small fan. It's a 100 and 120 volt fan. Um, it has a, a relatively limited ra radius of influence. And on the top, there's a, a little flow distribution system so that we can keep rain from coming in and, and, and get a little bit better discharge of any uh, extract, extracted uh, soil gases that we have. So we started it in late May of 2018. Um, we installed, we had, kept, we had uh, um, a couple of more Cox Colvin pins that we put in so that we could measure vacuum because in some places we knew we didn't really have as much ROI as we would have liked. Um, we measured the, the vacuum at the S SSVPs in June and July turn the system over in July. And then from there on, it's all theirs, even though they've tried to call us and they've called us and brought us in a couple of times for, uh, for some updates and a little bit of maintenance. So this is, um, shows how the layout is, what the west blower runs at 28 inches of, of, of water vacuum, east blower at 41. And then these are the associated uh, differential pressures that we measured in June of 2018. And you can see for the most part, we've got some pretty good vacuums. Some places we don't, this is under positive pressure because there's probably some uh, portion of the building itself interferes with the vacuum propagation. Um, this is where all the process area is. So there's probably some very large concrete structures underneath there to hold everything up. Um, but we, uh, so we were pretty happy with this distribution. You know, we, here's an inch of vacuum, you know, here's, uh, here's 
0.2 inches of vacuum. So this is 10 times more than our, than our minimum. And then we did it again in July 18, 2018. You see that the blowers themselves have increased vacuum, uh, which probably means that they did this run in a bit and, and they, um, they may be pulling against a little bit more water because sometimes you, know, you get water in the system. But again, our vacuums, measured vacuums pretty much increased across the board in our, in our area of main concern. And that was, this is where we had the issues with the ambient air. And then again, here are our July, June and July comparisons. Blue is process and um, orange is the packaging area. And you can see that we have um, increases in vacuum and negative numbers and increase pretty much across the board. So again, just to, to, uh, a little bit to, to, to wrap up here. Uh, the construction itself um, gave us some issues with uh, 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 of this facility, gave us some issues with how we could lay things out. You know, we had to take into account, account um, you know, not interfering with the process, uh, not, uh, not doing any damage during the installation uh, and trying to keep everything to the sides and as small a footprint as possible. Um, the, um, one of the things we found it's difficult to control sub-slab pressures near their building perimeter. Well, that's because you know, you're, you're working with the outside and there's quite a bit of communication between the, um, between the outside and inside there at the foundations. Um, knife gate valves uh, are simple ways to balance a system. And once they're, they're, they've been balanced, they typically don't have to be moved. Um, variable soil types required system flexibility. Uh, the staff was, was, was uh, tasked with operating it. Um, I'm not sure how much operation they actually did, uh, but it was still working when I was there about, uh, about five months ago. So it's one thing, uh, this is just a, a little bit more in the way of, of, of words to confuse you. TTO 15 is a, 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 a process, an analytical um, SOP uh, EPA that um, follows a specific protocol for extraction of, uh, um, of, of uh, collected soil gas. And it uses a device, a vacuum filled device, uh, one uh, like something that's called a SUMA canister. Um, there are also bottle vacs, which are preferred by, um, by Eagle. Um, one of the things that we ran into problems with was that we did a full scan. We did a full TO15 here. We ran into um, the chloroform. Uh, yeah, I'm glad we did because we were able to fix it, but it's something that we certainly didn't expect. And if we had been given a little bit more time on this, we may have been able to come up with a way of getting rid of the chloroform by changing out whatever process they were using for sanitation. I mean, maybe they don't need bleach. Maybe they could have used something else that would work. And so, and this is, these are the people that worked on it. Uh, we had a, um, we had quite a, quite a few people. Um, and Fernanda Wilson, who is also a, a, an alum of the program was uh, our, our pretty much our brains for the whole thing. And uh, that, that wraps it up. So if you guys have any questions, um, Let's uh, let's get let's, let's get into them. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Really appreciate that. Um, for those of you that have 421 uh, hydrology and groundwater, kind of combines some of that in terms of movement and soil of air and soils. Combines what we've been talking we have about in um, air pollution in terms of indoor air quality. We haven't talked about sampling, but significant sampling issues. Um, so feel free to ask any questions. I'm sure Mike would be happy to answer any questions about just the industry in particular or any questions you have about this um, system. So you can either unmute yourself and ask or feel free to write your questions in the chat. So um, while I'm waiting for questions, the, um, one of the things that, that it's very difficult to, to relay in this, in this situation is the amount of work that goes into putting one of these things together. It doesn't matter what kind of system it is. It doesn't matter if it's a sub-slab depressurization system or if it's a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, there is a ton of work before you can even put anything, any pencils to, to uh, you know, do any CAD drawings or any, any, any specifications. And with the, with the work that I do, all everything we do is based on analysis. It's based on taking samples, taking them in places that, that, that mean something, getting good analysis from our lab, making sure that the QAQC is in place. Um, I, I just can't stress that enough. I mean, I've had so many times and I've looked at 
at results, analytical results, is go, these don't make any sense. I mean, you know, their 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 um their detection limits are above our you know our minimum our our our, our MCLs or minimum concentration limits that are stipulated by the state, for example. Um, so a, a good working knowledge of the various processes and the various SOPs like the TO15 is really necessary. Um, uh, the, uh, and then when it comes to the, the things like a pilot test, well, I, I mean, I used a lot of stuff that I learned at, in, during my, 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 uh, my work at, uh, at MSU. Um, you need to know how to, how to use the devices, like, like how to use a manometer, how do you use a, um, a, a hot wire anemometer? I mean, you know, are, are the gauges telling you what you think they should be telling you? You know, recently we've gone back to using a canister vacuum to uh, apply va uh, to, to apply our, our power, our vacuum to our, 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 our pilot points, and it works great. Um, but then you need to be able to take a look at the data and see if it makes sense, do the data reduction, and then come up with a, a meaningful conclusion, which is in many cases, and at least in a, a sub-slab depressurization system, it's a radius of influence. Because that's going to tell you at what vacuum you're actually still moving air, and that's going to make allow you to select your blower. Thank you, Mike. We do have a question. Uh, the question is, does the industry usually use pilot scale testing as a way to model designs? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I've actually gotten into trouble a lot because that's the first thing I always say. Um, yeah, yeah, we need to do a pilot test. And people are like, no, we don't. Well, we end up doing pilot tests. You know, we've done pilot tests for, uh, for SV, SVE systems, soil vapor extraction systems, which are kind of a sister to what we're doing here. Um, a soil vapor extraction system is typically designed and used to extract vapors from the Vado zone above impacted groundwaters. Um, I've used pilot tests to, um, to proof out various applications for in situ uh, remediation of chlorinated solvents uh, in a process called ERD, reductive dechlorination. Um, we uh, will add a food source to a microcosm, existing microcosm, in order to uh, improve the, uh, um, or at least push the, the parameters of the environment what we're working in into a, into a place where a particular bacteria that we use uh, uh, are, are a lot happier. Um, and when things work, we can take PCE, you know, te tetrachloroethylene, and we can, we can take enough off all the chlorines and make it ethylene. Um, and uh, it's actually a system that I've Probably I've probably done 25 installations of this and it works very well, but you need a pilot test because there's a whole bunch of, of various um, uh, uh, applications out there. You, you pilot test to see how injectable the formation is um, or, or how much water you can get out of it. You know, there's lots of it. P pilot testing is, is super important and I, I just can't stress it enough. And it also gives you a chance to learn about, about what's going on. I mean, a lot of times you, you walk into these, all you have is a description maybe a geological description of the soil and it's like well that's great but how is it actually going to perform and that's what the pilot test will tell you thank you mike any other questions yeah i had a question sure uh how do you determine where you place your test sites like how do you know where to test and for what Right. So um, there's a couple of things that you consider here. And as the areas that you're working with get larger, it becomes a little more difficult to select uh, an area where I would put a pilot test uh, extraction point. And, and a lot of times I try to co-locate uh, co these with a design extraction point. So I said, you know, sometimes I'll say, well, if I was going to put a, you know, extraction points in here, where would I put them? You know, I put them in you know, all these places. Well, that's where I'm going to pilot test. Um, I typically see these ROIs on the order of 25 to 50 feet. And making the assumption that we're gonna get a 25 foot ROI, you can place your, your pilot test point so that if you have that ROI, you will cover the area you want to. Um, a lot of times the areas are defined by, um, by, by sub-slab sampling. And you can see, particularly in places where there's a groundwater issue, that they're pretty much, again, co-located with a groundwater issue. So the TCE, for example, will be carried down gradient in groundwater and it will volatilize into the Vado zone. Once it's in the Vado zone, there's not a whole lot that will move it except for vacuum. 
Um, and so there are, that's why we would apply a vacuum underneath a, uh, um, you know, a, a facility in order to move uh, a, you know, a, a material out. Uh, so with the one I just talked about, they are continually making chloroform. So there's no way that you'd be done with this. This is gonna go for forever for as long as they're gonna be doing their, their, their sanitation process. Um, but when you're selecting a pilot location, um, you have, typically you will have analytical data that will help, but there's also going to be um, um, a knowledge of what's under the floor. You should have floor plans, you should have uh, footing plans because all of these will interfere or affect the way that vacuum is propagated underneath the, underneath the building. Super cool, uh, thanks so much. <laughs> You're welcome, Josh. Other questions? Well, I'll just throw some stuff out and interrupt me. Um, so yeah, I, I, was, um, I was the only biologist in, uh, in the class that I went through with. Everybody else was, uh, was civil engineering, we had a couple of chemical engineers. Um, and uh, so it, it was a kind of a different, um, a different view for me. It's, I certainly struggled with a lot of classes. Um, <laughs> Susan, uh, Dr. Maston's uh, chemistry class was one I did okay in. Um, but when I got to some of the others, like uh, like so, like uh, I had uh, Mac Davis for uh, water wastewater, and uh, that was that was a real struggle. But you know, I eventually got through it, um, and it's a kind of amazing how much I uh, I still rely on that knowledge. I mean, I still have Mac Davis's book on on the shelf, and I I frequently will will go back to it. Um, and then you know, when it came down to graduate school, I mean, I did a um, I did a rather extensive uh, um, column study of, uh, of a, a location that's not that's in, in the Kalamazoo area. Um, and that took me a while. Um, and one thing that uh, that I actually had to repeat um, the experiment in order to prove prove that I actually got the results that I was I was I was demonstrating. But uh, once out of that, um, get, you know, getting my my master's degree, I, I um, started working at Fishbeck in 1996 and uh, worked with the process department, which was uh, water wastewater engineering. And then I moved in the remediation department and I've been here ever since. And you know, I've been all over the country uh, doing, uh, doing work in California, Virginia, um, you know, Ohio, Michigan, of course, Florida, uh, and on uh, all these places we've been able to, uh, to establish some pretty successful rem remediation uh, um, uh, projects. If we have no further questions, then so again, thank you so much, Mike.